Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, this is a very special evening because we have Gary over from New York um, to talk about his new book. And before, we, before I start with questions for you, Gary, and there's, I just want to say it is an amazing book and it's not quite yet in the UK, but it will be um, soon. Let's hope. <laughs> and um, I, was, I feel a bit, little bit like the godmother of the book because um, Gary sent me the first chapter and then I read as he wrote through the darkness of the pandemic and it was a, it was a real joy. So I feel um, that I was sort of maybe a little bit part of the beginnings of it and it's great to see it come um, get published and, and get the enormous um, success that it has received. So I wasn't the only one who enjoyed the book. Um, it shot to the New York Times bestseller list right away. And then uh, for a uh, period was the seventh most sold book in the world and just behind the Bible. Just so I thought it was... <laughs> I thought Bible, has a little, Bible has a little more enduring influence on the world than First Friends, but... I said to Gary, I'm going to stop at the seventh most sold book in the world and not say for how long, but yeah. we can ask you that question for how long it was. A, a nanosecond. <laughs> it's very impressive nonetheless. Um, but I just, um, I think just I want to launch straight into the questions to you, Gary, about the book so everyone can get a glimpse of these extraordinary stories that you tell uh, about the presidents and their best friends and how they influenced the decisions that they made, uh, both on a professional, uh, political level, but also on a personal level. And there's so much to go through, and I hope we can get through much of it so you can um, really see the many dimensions and the, and the range in history that you cover and the, the many dilemmas that these presidents, the nine presidents that you cover uh, are in and how they resolve that through the friendships that they have. And also questions around what if you don't have friends? You're <laughs> probably not as good a president as uh, you, you could have been. But um, Gary, the first question is obviously, you know, what inspired you to write the book? Well, before I give that answer, I do want to just say to Alexandra, she was literally the first person to read multiple chapters of my book. And it was your enthusiasm and your unwavering support for the project that gave me the confidence to write with the verve that I was able to, to generate in those last, say, seven months. So I'm indebted to you enormously for your friendship and for your support of the book and for hosting this lovely uh, this talk tonight. So thank you. Um, what inspired me to write this book? Well. I'd like to think that my fascination with the American presidency started when I was nine years old. I was in the third grade at an elementary school outside of Buffalo, New York, and the sixth grade class was staging a play on the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And I was absolutely fascinated um, from that play. And I came back to my third grade classroom, just I had to know everything about the American presidency. Now, why the sixth grade faculty would think that's an appropriate entry point for the third grade to learn about presidents, I'm not sure, but it worked for me. And I knew then that I wanted to be in politics. And I was really fortunate um, in 1984 to work for a presidential campaign of a senator named Gary Hart, who was running in the Democratic race for the nomination. And he had a best friend whom I witnessed at various times during the campaign named Warren Beatty, who was probably the most famous Hollywood actor at the time. And Warren would, was friends with Hart going back to 1972. They were absolutely best of friends. And he would fly in for some of the most important events. And he would talk to Hart in a way that nobody else on his staff could. He'd say, stop acting and talking like a politician, Gary. And Hart would be just jarred by it. But he would listen to him because he had equal stature to the candidate. He needed nothing from him. And they had a, a friendship that transcended anything else um, you know, the, the transcended certainly any relationship that he had on the campaign staff where you're serving at the pleasure of the candidate or the president if you win. So I witnessed this friendship and its uniqueness and the value that I saw to heart, not only intellectually and substantively, but also on an emotional level because he'd take him out for dinners, for late night dinners, because Warren Beatty was a night owl, and he'd give him this respite, this comfort, this joy, this relaxation that he desperately needed running for president. Fast forward eight years, I saw the same dynamic at play with Vernon Jordan and Bill Clinton, which I write about in my book, and that extraordinary friendship that they enjoyed and what benefits I saw 
that accrued to Bill Clinton as first a candidate and then as president over the eight years that he served in the White House. So in 2018, I, I think part of why it was so, all kind of came together was I was watching Donald Trump. And I realized that he didn't have that first friend. And I was asking myself, what are the implications of that? You know, why does he seem so untethered? Why does he feel so unnatural? Why does he often feel so angry? Um, and I, I think part of me thought it was that lack of a first friend. And so I decided to look at presidential literature to see what was written about first friendships. There's been nothing. There have been books about first wives, first chefs, first butlers, first decorators, first pets. But no one had ever looked at the role of the first friend and what the influence that friend had on the man and the presidency. So I decided it was high time to fill that niche. Oh, hang on. The, select, the way you selected the nine, what, what was, could you talk us through why you picked the ones you picked and who was on the verge of getting included and, and reasons yeah. not to include them? Well, um, I wanted to cover the sweep of American history. So I wanted to find a friendship that dated back to the 18th century and then I was hoping to take it to the 21st century. I knew I wanted to do Bill Clinton he was the only president who I was actually able to ask, who is your first friend? And if you know anything about Bill Clinton, he had an enormous capacity for friendship. There was, there was an acronym on the campaign called the FOBs, the Friends of Bill. And he credits his friends with helping elect him president, which I'm happy to get into. It's a longer story. So I called him up and he said, I love the idea, but I've, I need some time to think about it because he had so many first friends. Fortunately, he came back and said Vernon Jordan. And I had already gone to Vernon Jordan because I was hoping that he would pick him, because I had witnessed the friendship. I knew Vernon. I was a friend of Vernon's. And um, so I did that chapter, obviously. I, I also wanted to do John Kennedy, because he too, like Clinton, had an enormous capacity for friendship. He had friends from every stage of his life, beginning with his childhood, going to Choate, stretching right on through um, his years in the Navy, his years uh, in New York, Washington, et cetera. I was able to ask his daughter, Caroline, um, who was a good friend of mine from law school, and I said, who is your dad's best friend? Because even though she was only six when her dad died, she lived, you know, she obviously lived with a lot of her father's best friends for decades afterward, because her father died so young. And she gave me a name of, a, of actually a British um, foreign diplomat named uh, David Ormsby Gore, who's not a name that normally is associated with John Kennedy's best friends. But she told me, you need to do a little bit of work. It's going to take some digging. But I guarantee you, you will see why I think that he was my dad's best friend. And hopefully, if you read the chapter, you'll see the role that he played both on an intellectual level as well as on an emotional level. It's an extraordinary 25-year friendship. Can I just you jump wanna, in there? I want to jump in, I yes. jump in there. I sure. also just want to say that if anyone has questions, just jump in, raise your hand, or catch my eye, and, and you know we'll We'll pose questions to you throughout the talk because I think as you go through the presidency, yeah, more fun for me too. Yeah, there's yeah. probably a lot of questions. I'd love to get to to Nixon. Love to get further into to Clinton as well. But if we could just dwell with with Kennedy sure. for a moment, which yeah. actually happened to be my favorite chapter, also the first one I, I it was read. the first one you read. And yes. um, it, it, it's an extraordinary journey that that friendship takes. And I wonder if you could just take us through how they met and sure and how they how they um what his friendship meant throughout his friendship with with kennedy but also later on with jackie yeah it's the only first friendship um i'll just kind of cut to the chase only first friendship that later resulted in the friend um, proposing to uh his best friend's widow which is a, str a strange twist that i didn't know when Caroline first recommended this story. Um, they met in 1938, pre-war London. Um, Kennedy's father was the ambassador, the US ambassador uh, to Britain. And um, David Ormsby Gore was uh, just a 19-year-old, 20-year-old Oxford student who really didn't know what he was going to do in his life. They were second sons of very powerful men who loved to talk fast. They never liked to be bored. They loved to play golf, they loved to go to horse races, they loved to gossip, and they loved to carouse. And they just bonded instantly. And one of the things they bonded over was 
what it means to be a leader in a democracy. Because in 1938, England, Britain, the big question was how to respond to German rearmament and rising militarism. And if you remember, Stanley Baldwin and then Chamberlain didn't want to, particularly Stanley Baldwin, basically went to sleep because he believed the electorate didn't want to rearm. So Britain did not try to match the Germans' you know, militaristic moves. Mm -hmm. Churchill, on the other hand, was arguing for rearming in the face of this threat. And so a book came out in 1938, The Arms and the Covenant, and it started this debate that lasted for 25 years about how should a leader act in a democracy? Should he accede to the wishes of the electorate and wait for the electorate to decide to do the right thing? Or does a leader have an obligation to do what is right? And if you end up losing the electorate and lose an election, so be it. It's your duty to do what's right. And Kennedy was more waffling kind of in the Chamberlain Baldwin camp because his dad was frankly, you know, an appeaser back then, was very much again, very pro German at that period. They debate this for 25 years and it plays a really important role when Kennedy is president. Um, so just to fast forward from 1938 to 1960, David Ormsby Gore becomes Jack Kennedy's most important foreign policy advisor. At the time he's, he's serving in the, um, he's ser serving in the foreign service of, of Great Britain. He's a nuclear disarmament expert. Kennedy loves his mind and he says, all my advisors on the 60 campaign, they're old and tired. I'm a new frontier kind of guy. I need new thinking. I need somebody that I feel comfortable with, who I have a mind meld with. So he asked Ormsby Gore to essentially become his de facto foreign policy advisor. And Ormsby Gore helps message him through the 60 campaign such that he wins. Now he's president of the United States. Because he's so close, um, Macmillan names him the, US, the British ambassador to the United States. So now Ormsby Gore is in Washington with his best friend of 23 years at this point. And Kennedy starts to rely on him for his most important foreign policy decisions. Most prominently, how do I respond to, British, to um, Soviet missiles in Cuba? It's the 13-day Cuban Missile Crisis. And as you'll see in my book, hopefully, when you read it, the person he most wants to talk it out with, should I bomb or should I blockade, is David Ormsby Gore, the British ambassador. He reads him into it right away. He debates this seminal question of bombing or blockading. Ormsby Gore helps set the perimeter without any instructions from his own government. He says, Jack, it shouldn't be 800 miles, it should be 500 miles because you gotta let the British ships, you know, the Soviet ships have more time to think about the implications of, block, block, of breaking the blockade. He helps him through the Cuban Missile Crisis. He's a key advisor throughout that. And then a year later, only because of their friendship and because of Ormsby Gore's intellectual force, does Jack Kennedy sign the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which was probably the most important treaty that he signed during his thousand days as president, which marked the beginning of the end of the Cold War. But at the same time as being a brilliant intellectual mind meld, or intellectual melding of two minds, they were also best friends. Um, they spent more weekends together as couples than any other friend of Kennedy's. Kennedy loved to relax with them. They golfed, they went on um, sailing trips off of Hyannis. And when Kennedy's third child was born, Gore's wife, Sissy, was gonna be the godmother to this third child, but the child died three days after he was born. So it gives you a measure of how they were both intellectual soulmates, but also just personal um, soulmates. And um, to your question, they were so close that three months after Ormsby Gore's wife died in 1967, David Ormsby Gore proposed to Jackie Kennedy in, a, in a anger wad. And then in a series of letters that were only dis discovered in 2017 when the family of Ormsby Gore discovered a, 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 a trunk filled with letters that he had uh, received and written but had not sent to Jackie. And one of them was basically asking her again to marry him. And she wrote back a really beautiful letter which said, you and I have suffered so much pain together. We live in a world of hurt and a world of pain. And if we're ever to achieve any kind of happiness in our lives, we have to do it in our own worlds. We have to meet our own separate mates. And so she went off and married Ari Onassis. 
he went off and married uh, a Vogue uh, editor living in, in Britain. Um, but it was, a, it was a real love affair, I think, which was the, f the only time, as I say, the first friend ended up in a romantic relationship with the uh, But it was inter wife. interesting that he felt drawn to her because of the pain, and she couldn't be with him because of the pain, is yeah. how I think yeah. you expressed. Was a, a quick question going back to that friendship and the decisions that are made on very important um, moments in, in American history. Is, is there any resentment among his staff around that? That's a great question. Yeah, in fact, um, I talked about his centrality in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So mm -hmm. at one point, Kennedy has these ex-com meetings in the cabinet room, and it's Kennedy mm -hmm. seated right to his left is David Ormsby Gore. Okay, now it's all US officials and the British ambassador to the United States sitting right to the left of the president. Lyndon Johnson, who was the vice president, is sitting at the end of the table, right where the door to the cabinet room is. And the door keeps banging on LBJ's chair at one point. And LBJ blurts out, God damn it, I'm sitting here at the end of the table, but my, my chair is getting banged on. And that British limey sitting there next to the president has got this seat of honor. And he hated it. But to, the, to other foreign policy advisors, to Kennedy, McGeorge uh, Bundy, um, Dean Rusk, they just knew that it was a friendship that was so deep and long-lasting that they couldn't compete and didn't try to compete and actually learned to accept it. And Bobby Kennedy, who was Kennedy's probably his closest advisor and friend in life, I, I chose not to include close family members in the definition of first friend because I think family is just a different kind of relationship than a friend is. I think we can all relate to that in our own lives. So I excluded family and I, I excluded staff. Because I think that, as I said earlier, with um, Hart, you know, staff ultimately serves at the pleasure of the, of the candidate or the president. And there's a limit to really how far you can go in speaking the blunt truth and giving the unvarnished truth to the candidate. So I thought it would be a pure definition to only to exclude those two categories. But Bobby Kennedy, just going back to him, loved David Ormsby Gore, thought he was invaluable to his brother. He became a really close, close friend of Bobby's and was a ball bearer at his funeral. But I think he appreciated more than anybody how important Ormsby Gore was to, to Kennedy, to his brother's life. Are there any question, questions on, thank, Tessa, you have a question? Yeah. Um, like, sorry, sorry, I'm nine, nine presidents, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really thoughtful question. Um, I'll tell you one presidency where the friendship changed to the detriment of the president and to the country, and that was Bibi Rebozo and Richard Nixon. And I'll just give you one anecdote that illustrates it. So Bibi Rebozo was, Jack, was um, Richard Nixon's only friend, but Nixon, who was a dark, brooding, morbid man, had the emotional sophistication to know that he needed at least one friend. So he found the exact opposite in his first friend, a guy who wasn't an intellectual, had only graduated from high school, was a Pan Am steward as opposed to you know, a lawyer, which Nixon was, and then a brooding congressman and senator. He was ebullient. He loved to mix a martini, cook a Cuban steak. Nixon, left to his own devices, would just sit in a chair with a yellow legal pad and never talk to anybody. But the brilliance of Bibi Rebozo, and the reason why he was his first friend for 45 years, was because he knew just when to break Nixon out of his dark, brooding silences and lift him back into the world and, and kind of break that, that, um, that, that dark strain of thought that so consumed him throughout his life. He was a sad kid. He was a sad vice president, a sad president. But Bibi brought him back into the world. And so they, they reveled in each other's company because they each were able to give the other what they needed. Bibi just wanted to be around power. 
B.B. loved to service. He was a Pan Am steward, as I said, so he loved to service this powerful man and give him that levity, give him the food, the nourishment that he so desperately needed. In 1967, um, Bibi Rebozo was by his side for every single campaign. He was with him in 60 when he lost the presidency to Kennedy. He was with him in 62 when he lost the, the California governorship. Dick Nixon was such a dark man that it's very likely, as I discovered in my research, that he beat Pat Nixon physically. The family was in tatters for those seven years um, because of these, these losses. So Rebozo in 67, when Nixon's thinking about running for president, says, don't run because I know the, the cost to your family and I don't want the, your two daughters to face that again and I don't want Pat to face that. Nixon doesn't listen to him, ignores me, runs for president. In 1969, Nixon now is president and he becomes um, very insecure about his power and he wants to start hurting his enemies and he starts all these kind of nefarious acts to hold on to power, one of which is to raise illegal campaign funds. And he goes to Bieber of Bozo and he says, I want you to help me raise off the books campaign money. Rebozo, as opposed to doing what he did in 67, which is Dick Don't Run, which was against his interests, instead of saying to him, no, you need to appeal to your better angels, you don't need to do this, I'm not gonna help, I'm not gonna be an enabler, I'm not gonna abet this, th these misdeeds, willingly becomes an accomplice. He takes a $100,000 bribe from Howard Hughes, which I write about in my book, and I believe it was that bribe which ultimately resulted in Dick Nixon bugging the DNC headquarters in 1972, which led to his impeachment and led to his resignation. And it's an example of where a first friend, it wasn't transactional in the strict definition of that word, but it's where a best friend didn't rise to the moment, didn't do what he had been able to do in 67, which was do something that was against his interest that he thought was in, the Nixon, in Nixon's best interest. And he just lost that courage two years later with enormously negative consequences for Nixon and the country. Tessa, did you have a follow-up question? There's a question there, and then a question in the front afterwards. Yeah. Did you have a question about characters who had um, maybe who had exercised kind of undue fascination on the president? Yes, um, <laughs> it's funny. So you asked a question about um, the longevity of friendships. With one exception, everybody had a friendship that long predated the president uh, walking into the Oval Office. This was Colonel House, and Colonel House became best friends with Woodrow Wilson a year before he became president. Colonel House was a, a Texan political fixer who got tired of becoming the most powerful man in Texas and wanted to operate on a much larger stage. And he was looking for, quote, the man and the opportunity in 1911 at the very moment that Woodrow Wilson, who was the governor of New, of, um, New Jersey, was looking for a new best friend. His best friend had been a member of the Princeton faculty when he was president, and they had a terrible, vicious um, split, and it gutted Woodrow Wilson. And now he's governor of New Jersey, he's gonna run for president, and he needs to fill that void with the best friend. So there's just a perfect confluence of interests. In November of 1911, they have a dinner and a lunch in, in one week's time period, and they fall in love. And Wilson needs Colonel House, because he's a really shrewd but warm man, and House needs Wilson because he's going to become president of the United States and he can operate now in a much larger stage than the state of Texas. So he, to your question, he quickly assumes so much power that as I start my chapter with, at one and the same time, with no accountability to anybody, he wasn't appointed to a job, he wasn't confirmed by the Senate, he didn't hold any security clearances. At one and the same time, he was the head of presidential personnel, the head of the CIA, the Secretary of State, the head of the NSC. This man basically ran all of American foreign policy during the tumultuous years of 1913 to 1919. And we all know, as Brits and Americans, that was the First World War. So here's this man who knows nothing about diplomacy, never studied foreign policy, never negotiated a treaty, never met a foreign leader. He spends literally five, six years traversing this continent, 
trying to forge first a peace before war breaks out and then a truce when the war breaks out. It was an amazing amalgamation of power by someone who really had no business doing it. The friendship takes a tragic twist because Wilson's first wife dies, his second wife becomes very jealous right off the bat. You asked about jealousy. So this was a case where a wife was so intensely jealous of a first friend that right off the bat, before they were even married, she starts just nipping at him, saying, he's weak, he's obsequious. Are you sure you really need him? Are you sure you like him? It takes four years, but she eventually extracts what she needs, which is the complete banishment of Colonel House in 1919, the night that the Paris, the Versailles Treaty was signed. He spends the next 20 years of his life trying to make sense of his banishment, never really does. But it's an example that you'll never see again. You'll never see a private citizen have that kind of unaccountable power in the United States government. It can't happen. It's a good question. Does it, yeah, question in the back there. Uh, so Gary, um, I can't help but notice your own career has very much been a counselor and advisor at a very senior level to Apple. I think subconsciously it did, actually. Um, I had um, I'd worked, before I worked for Murdoch, I worked um, for John Kennedy Jr. We went to college together, and he started a political magazine. And I don't normally talk about this, but since we were talking about his father in the, in the context of his first friend, um, I was by no means John's first friend, but he, um, he started a political magazine called George, and he was going to be surrounded by people he didn't know starting a, you know, a rather high profile business. And I think he really wanted somebody that he trusted, who he felt comfortable with, who could tell him what was up, what was down, interpret things that I was seeing among the other staff. So I joined him for the start of that magazine. And I think in a role, although I say I wasn't his best friend by no means, but I was a close friend, I think I saw the value of having somebody who could speak that truth but also provide that respite, because we used to go out into the park and play frisbee for ungodly amounts of time. So I think I first kind of sensed it there. But with Murdoch, and you, John, you know this because you covered, you've covered the Murdoch empire, there, there was so little distinction between Rupert's personal life and his professional life that Murdoch's closest friends were really his business associates. I think the important thing I learned from Murdoch was the danger of groupthink, of having people in your C-suite or even in your own life who can, who can kind of break that groupthink and tell you what you need to hear, even if it's painful to tell you. And I think that's what a first friend, you know, the real value of a first friend is, is being able to speak that hard truth even when you don't want to hear it. And I know with Murdoch, part of why I wanted to join his, his C-suite, and I think part of why he wanted me to join is that I wasn't like everybody else in his entourage. You know, I was younger. I was a Democrat. He called me his resident Trotskyite. But I think in part it's because he just wanted somebody different around him who thought differently and could create that tension in his, you know, in the deliberations around his business. So I think that's really, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was a first friend to Rupert, but I think that was somewhat the value that I brought there. Thank you. Um, one question there first in the right side, and then on the right side. Do we have that? Over here? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Um, it's just making me think of my friends and how I treat them and who I go to when I'm dealing with something like me, like, uh, you know, whenever I'm dealing with something kind of heavy, then I don't know how to think about it, I don't know how to deal with it. And I was thinking the person I always go to is my friend who just, like, makes fun of me, makes mm -hmm. me laugh. And yeah. I think, like that's I think just being relaxed and finding things funny is like my like way of dealing with things. Um, and I was just wondering if there's any relationship or friendship that you've looked at. I don't know where the nature of it was really interesting. Yes. Like, like how do they treat each other? How, yes. how do they respect each other? Yeah. They humiliate? Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Um, when I when I was doing my chapter on Clinton and Jordan, I interviewed Hillary Clinton, 
And I said, what do you think is the most important role of a first friend from your perspective as a first lady? And she said, respite. She said, presidents are so stressed all the time. Bill was so stressed. He looks like he's at ease, but he's stressed. And there's, it's a lonely office. And so the friend to her was the person who could provide that respite. And I did, um, so I have one female as a first friend. I wish I had more, but you know, it really took a couple of uh, centuries for Americans to finally have women in senior roles in government. And FDR was the first president to actually bring women into his inner circle. He, had, he loved women, but he, he was much more comfortable around women than he was with men, which I write about. But I chose his seventh cousin, Daisy Sukley. Now, I know I said family was excluded, but she's a seventh cousin, right? <laughs> so he can get away with it. And the reason why I chose her is because I wanted to illustrate that aspect to the important role of a first friend, because she didn't advise FDR on a, on a consequential issue. She didn't help him formulate a treaty to end nuclear testing. But what she did was just important. She was the antidote to his loneliness. I mean, it seems odd that a president who's fighting a world war, fighting a depression, would be lonely. But he was. Um, his wife was often away from Washington crusading for her, her causes. His children really wanted nothing to do with the White House. They were either off to war or ne'er-do-wells. So as he said to Daisy one day, I'm either exhibit A or left entirely alone. And he's a gregarious guy. He likes to be around people, and he didn't want to be alone. One day, he had 22 separate meetings in 1944. Now, I don't know about you, but after 22 separate meetings, I'd want to go to bed. What did he want to do? He wanted to have dinner with Daisy Sukley. Because Daisy Sukley, as I said, was the antidote to that loneliness. She got him. She was fun. She was whip smart. She spoke five languages. She never married, so she had, never had a family. And her job was to help become an archivist to his library, his, his, his new library that he'd started in 1941. But she just intuited things about him that nobody else did. She emotionally was connected to him. And he reveled in her presence as she reveled in his presence. And so they spent an ungodly amount of time together. At one point, I think it, it became slightly sexual, which I write about in 1935 when um, they went, took a, he, she spent more time in his hand, he, he, you know, he had polio, so he couldn't, he couldn't walk. So he had, um, he, he had a hand, a hand powered roadster that was, allowed him to drive the roadster. And she spent more time in his car than anybody else. But one day they went up to the, the to what was called Top Cottage on top of a hill in Dutchess County where they each grew up. And they shared a kiss. So I think there was a sexual attraction for sure. But as I, I did a lot of research on this to determine was it actually a sexual relationship or not, because the writings didn't indicate that it was. But I think it, in part, it started because there was a real physical attraction between the two. But clearly, over the next 10 years, from 35 to 45, it really was a deeply emotional relationship where each reveled in the presence of the other. And I talked to one historian who said, without Daisy Sukley, FDR would have been a much less settled, much less natural president than he was. So I think she's a great example of that. There's other examples in my book where it's a hybrid. It's both um, an important intellectual mind meld as well as that relaxation, fun element. But she's the one example where it was really that side of the equation. <clears throat> And also, I want us to go to um, Clinton and Vernon Jordan in a minute, and then go back to Jefferson and, and Madison. Because, but just with Clinton and, and, and Jordan, there's some support that he gives Clinton yeah. on a political level, but also on a personal level. But before we do that, I know there's a there's a question at the front here um, that I thought we'd go to first, and then we'd. Um, did you ever come across a president who was as lonely as Trump? And what was the effect of that? And also, if you had to do a chapter on Trump, who would you pick? <laughs> so, um, That's a good so I was writing this during the entirety of the Trump presidency. So I naturally thought, you know, maybe I'll try to do a chapter on Trump, even though I don't think he's got a first friend. So my publisher said absolutely not, but I was curious. So I called somebody who's very, very senior 
in the administration, and um, we started a dialogue on who is the president's first friend. I almost gave away who he is. Um, and um, we couldn't settle on a name. This person kept going back and forth. Finally, it was clear that there was going to be no name forthcoming from the Trump White House, because you need a name, and then you need to get the president to agree to do the interview. So it, it didn't happen. The person called me back after my manuscript was in. He said, listen, I kind of filibustered you for a reason, which is he doesn't have a first friend. He just doesn't. He said, there's a couple of friends who call every week, Ike Perlmutter, who um, started Marvel Comics. He talked to him every week, maybe twice a week. This guy, Phil Ruffin would call, he's a casino man. But you know, it wasn't like the kind of friendships that you and I have. Like, they're not talking about you know, their hopes, aspirations, fears, love lives. They're just talking, am I doing a good job? Am I not doing a good job? So he said, I just didn't have one for you because he doesn't have one. And what he basically said to me was that, and this is kind of probably more how I interpreted it than what he directly said, because he's quite a partisan, is that I think Trump was constitutionally incapable of a first friendship. And it kind of goes to what you were saying. You have to have a first friendship, you have to give a little bit of yourself, right? You have to show interest, curiosity, empathy, compassion. You want to, you know, you know, it has to be kind of a mutual sharing of values and interests for it to be a real first friendship. Trump wasn't capable of that. And just to illustrate that, th this person said to me, and we'd go up to Camp David for weekends, and he'd bring along friends and family. And what he would do the entirety of the weekends was sit in this cabin and just call around to supporters, sometimes anonymous, sometimes people he knew, just to find out how am I doing. And I think at the end of the day, his first friend was that base, was the Twitter feed, was the affirmation of that kind of amorphous body that allowed him to feel whole, that allowed him to feel like, okay, I'm doing a good job, I'm a good person. Not the way I'd wanna live my life. So there, would, there was no Trump chapter as a result. Um, the two people who were probably the least suitable to, to, suited to real friendship were Nixon and Woodrow Wilson, ironically, which had probably two of the most dysfunctional first friendships of the nine that I write about. But as I say, they each were smart enough to know that they needed a first friend. Wilson's daughter wrote that the two great tragedies in his life were the breakup of his first best friend, this professor on the Princeton faculty, and the failure to pass the League of Nations Treaty. So this is a guy who really needed that one first friend. And I think, for this, and I think Nixon, too, just needed that one friend. Trump's, I think Trump is, and I, I, I said this in, a, in a, something I wrote for um, a blog, I think Trump's the only president that truly had no friend, no first friend. Because I looked at a lot of presidents. I mean, our worst presidents had first, I mean, I write about Franklin Pierce. It's my second chapter. Um, an abysmal president, a sad, sad man, but he had a genuinely deep relationship with the author Nathaniel Hawthorne, you know, the author of The Scarlet Letter. Um, and it was really meaningful, and it really helped him in his life, and it helped Hawthorne. Um, but yeah, Trump, I think Trump's the anomaly. What about Obama? So Obama has a lot of really good friends. He has one first friend who I um, did some due diligence on. I, I, I was then connected to him. And I called him um, beginning of 2019. And um, his name is Marty Nesbitt. And if you read Obama's uh, memoir, uh, Promised Land, he's featured throughout. So I called up Marty and I said, I'm writing this book and I'd love to talk to you. He goes, God, I've been waiting five years to tell this story. <laughs> Fantastic. I've got so many great stories. Barack is coming to Chicago. I know he's going to want to do it. I'll call you as soon as he leaves and we'll get this going. Still waiting for that phone call. <laughs> I think what happened was Obama was under a tight deadline for his memoir, A Promised Land. And frankly, you know, if you're Barack Obama, why do you want to identify one first friend when there's at least six or seven people who are alive and well who think that they're the first friend? <laughs> you know, so I, I think he just made a calculation and I don't blame him. I think Clinton um, picked Vernon Jordan because Vernon was, was, getting, was getting sick and, um, and I think Vernon was 
so important to Clinton, both on an emotional level as well as on a substantive level. His, he had a lot of first friends, but more on the respite side, more the palling around um, than that really potent combination of both you know, helping him further his goals as president as well as giving him that respite. Do you want to take us a bit deeper into the Vernon, uh, Jordan, and Clinton uh, sure. friendship? And, and also just um, where, how they met, because sure. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And the advice that he gives them on a personal level through, through their friendship. Yeah. Um, he actually meets Hillary first in 1969. And um, Hillary says, I'm sitting on a park bench. I'm looking at a schedule. And suddenly this man with a booming voice appears before me. And I look from his shiny shoes up to his head and I was mesmerized from the first sight of, of Vernon. And they became great friends. Clinton doesn't meet him until 1977. Clinton likes to say that they met in 73, but I did my research and it was 77. But what's interesting is that they really hit it off and I write it at some length about their first meeting because it somewhat um, portends how the relationship will play out over the next um, 40 some years. Um, I won't go into the details because it's too risque. Um, but in 1980, Bill Clinton, is, who's a winner all throughout his, his early life, loses his re-election for uh, Arkansas governor. And he is bereft. He does not know what to do. He doesn't know what's up, what's down. And he's calling around to all of his friends, and no one can give him any sense of comfort or direction as to what he should do. So he's seriously thinking about leaving politics. And he's got like six or seven job offers because he's a boy wonder. Vernon, who's now a three-year-old friend of his, is watching this from New York. He's a civil rights icon by this point. And he says, uh-uh, I'm not going to let this guy leave politics. So he flies down to Little Rock. And over a breakfast of grits, which I write about extensively, he basically says to Bill Clinton, you are not going to leave politics. You are too talented to leave this game. So buck it up. You know, pick up your trousers, be a big boy here, and get over your loss because there's going to be a, there's going to be brighter days ahead, and redouble your efforts to get reelected because you're going to be a great success. It was that conversation which Clinton told me and Hillary told me was absolutely dispositive in his decision to stay in politics. Lo and behold, ten years later, well, two years later, he's reelected governor of Arkansas, and then ten years later, he's the president of the United States, and it was really because. Vernon Jordan was able to connect with him in such a personal way and really reach into his soul and convince him to do things. Because I, I think they were both sons of the South. They were both progressive in their politics. I think Clinton looked up to Vernon in a way he looked up to nobody else. When Vernon was on the campaign, and I witnessed this, I didn't mention this, but he was of equal stature to Clinton in the, world, in the eyes of influential people. Because Vernon Jordan, as I said, was an icon by that point. He had run. Um, major civil rights organizations have been on the cover of every major national magazine. He was the most powerful lawyer and lobbyist in the country. And so when Vernon talked to Bill, it was like, you know, listening to God speak. And they also loved, they loved women, they loved politics, they loved sports. They were both six foot three, handsome guys who electrified in any room that they were in. So they kind of loved to be together because they could just feed off of the energy that each kind of elicited. And I could feel, you know, I felt it myself. It was extraordinary. Men, women, you know, everybody, you would just revel in their presence because they were just such dynamic people. And um, just, I'll just go to what you, you were asking. Um, Vernon just, Vernon played somewhat the same role that Colonel House did. He was involved in every major personnel decision in the Clinton White House. Clinton didn't make a decision whether it was vice president, um, secretary of state, attorney general, without Vernon. He wanted Vernon to be the first person of color to be uh, the American attorney general. And Vernon flies down to Little Rock after Clinton is elected, before he's inaugurated, and he says, no, Bill, don't make me responsible for an agency. I can be more valuable to you as your first friend. Because then I'm not burdened by administrative duties. I'm not burdened by a vertical of having to deal with the legal issues of the country. I can do whatever you need me to do. And for the next eight years, he did. That's what was astonishing. He was involved in Don't Ask, Don't Tell. He was involved in 
um, the welfare reform. He was involved in you know, all the critical policy decisions. He'd always say, get Vernon. That was kind of the mantra, and Vernon would show up. Um, it takes a kind of weird turn because Vernon becomes a key witness in his impeachment over his Monica Lewinsky relationship. And what's interesting is that at one point, I'm the first person I think to discover this, was Hillary Clinton was gonna leave Bill Clinton after he admitted to his affair, first to her and then to the country in August of 1998. And somebody very senior, I don't know why she told me, but for the first time she said, listen, she was leaving him. And it was Vernon who talked her out of it. So I dug around and I was able to confirm it with another senior member. And then I asked Clinton about it. I said, did you really send Vernon to talk Hillary out of leaving you? And he said, yeah. He said, there was nobody else that I trusted to have that conversation. And there was nobody else that Hillary respected enough to have that conversation. So Vernon um, played such an important role in the future of, I mean, think about the implications had Hillary left the president in the midst of that impeachment saga. Um, but it, it was a really extraordinary friendship because of that, again, that duality of both the policy side, the personnel side, as well as the human side. Just checking if there are any questions. There's a question in the back there. Um, Two questions. Clinton was from the Holmes president, obviously the most powerful man in the world. Um, that would affect virtually every friendship. So do you see if there's any one particular example of where the, the, the nature of the friendship starts to tilt? Or that all because they're devolving, they basically have a stake in the military? Yeah. See, I think that's the measure of whether the friendship is tr a genuine friendship or not. Because if it, if it changes in character once the president is in office, then I don't think it's a true first friendship. And I was fortunate in the nine stories, with the one exception of Bibi's failure to stand up to Nixon on the, the, the bad acts, the friendship stayed the same, which I think was illustrative of the depth of those friendships. Because I think that, I mean, I, there's one chapter that we haven't talked about where um, it's Truman's best friend who um, had met him in 1903 when he was 16 and Truman was 23. And now it's 1948 and Truman's got to make a really critical decision about the land of Palestine. And this first friend walks into the White House, walks into the appointment secretary and says, I got to see Harry. And he got, the appointment secretary knows he's his best friend and says, fine, go in there, but don't talk about Palestine. He doesn't want to talk, he's furious about the whole issue. First friend walks in there, Eddie Jacobson, and talks to him in terms of, you know, I'm even afraid to talk to my first friend, my best friend in. It, it was as if they were back in Kansas City, you know, on a hunting trip arguing about, you know, whether the Kansas City Royals, whatever the team was in 1948, you know, was gonna win the NBA champion, whatever the league was called then. He just went in there and they just had a knockdown, drag out fight. And Eddie Jacobson said, I ain't leaving until you do what's right and what you know you need to do. And Truman finally, after a very tense stand, you know, showdown in the Oval Office, turns around and says, God damn it, you bald headed son of a bitch, I'll do what you need to do. And I won't go into the, <laughs> I won't go into the details. It's actually a really interesting story and it leads to um, the recognition by Harry Truman of the State of Israel. He was the first foreign leader, 11 minutes after the state was declared in Tel Aviv, to recognize the state. And the implications of that were enormous for the relationship that has ensued between the United States and Israel. And it was really only because Truman's best friend flew halfway across the country and had the bravery and the temerity and the, and the closeness to just cut through all the BS that was in Truman's head and convinced him to do what was right. I'm going to get to um, the question in the back in a minute, but there were just uh, um, Clinton has read your book, and I'm very curious about what he thought of the chapter. But I also want us to go back to Jefferson and Madison because I think you say that that is one of the friendships in U.S. history that has had, has had the biggest impact on the U.S. But maybe before we go to those questions, yeah. we could just go to the sure. question in the back. Sorry, I just, uh, one question, um, in, in any friendships, whether the 
nine or other ones that you, you were researching for picking your nine that struck out as having the most ideological differences between the two? So you talked about Lord Harleth and um, yeah. how, how intellectually close they were. Any, any kind of really non political and you know, really kind of ideological difference, and any that were particularly non political? Well, let me, I'll give you an ideological difference that where the, it, the friendship transcended the ideological difference. So I do a chapter on Abraham Lincoln and his first friend, Joshua Speed. And they slept in a, the same double bed together for four years, if you can believe it, but it wasn't sexual. Because back in those days, um, men would hop into bed with other men because there weren't a lot of holiday inns around. And there was a dearth of beds and a lot of men who needed to find bedding for the night. They ended up doing it for four years, which was a little unusual, but they forged an incredibly intense um, friendship. And this, and I'll get to the ideological difference in a minute, but what was extraordinary about this is that they were so close that when Joshua Speed told Lincoln that he was gonna move out of the bed and move back to his home state of Kentucky, Lincoln became suicidal and took to his bed, and his best friend delayed his return to Kentucky to basically take away all of his sharp objects and minister to him so he wouldn't kill himself as he intended to. And he said, you know, if I kill myself, Speed, no one's going to know the name Abraham Lincoln. Well, Speed made sure that the world knew Abraham Lincoln. Where the ideological difference comes in is that in the, 19, in the 1850s, um, slavery is becoming you know, it was always a big issue. It was always a divisive issue. But in the 1850s, it's getting really bad because Franklin Pierce, who I mentioned earlier, really screwed up his presidency and allowed slavery to flourish in areas where it had been banned by compromises that had been reached earlier that kind of kept this fragile country together. But in the mid-1850s, it's breaking apart. And Lincoln um, starts writing letters to Speed about slavery. Speed owns 20 slaves. He believes that slavery is a constitutional right, is a fundamental right, that is, uh, is a cherished right that he, he'll, he'll be damned that he's going to give up. And he makes it very clear in letters to Lincoln. Lincoln is kind of working through his own views about slavery in letters back. And it's clear that they're not going to meet on this issue. But their friendship actually kind of reflourishes as a result of these letters. And, you have to appreciate that in the 1840s, after Speed finally moves back to Kentucky, they kind of grow apart because does, Lincoln does all this legal work for him that Speed doesn't pay him for, and Lincoln gets mad. They're still friends, but the slavery issue brings them back together. In 1860, when Lincoln is elected, the first person he wants to see is Speed. So Speed meets him in, in um, Chicago. Speed was a Democrat. Lincoln was a Republican. Speed's a slave owner. Lincoln is becoming, in a sense, an abolitionist. Nevertheless, Lincoln says to Speed, what's your financial condition? He says, I'm rich. He says, OK, I don't care. I need you in my government. Speed says, I'm too rich. I'm not going to serve in your government. But I'm going to do something better for you. I'm going to make sure that Kentucky stays in the Union. And for the next two years, it was one of the four border states. So if you lose Kentucky, you're probably going to lose the, the whole union because you're going to lose four more states and then the south is far more powerful than the north the south probably wins the war Joshua Speed sits in Kentucky and even though he's he's a pro-slavery guy he makes sure that all the arms that the north is sending to Kentucky gets in the in the right hands of union militiamen he helps Lincoln message the war to Kentuckians so that they don't think it's about slavery but they think it's about preserving the union and Joshua Speed not only saved Lincoln's life, literally his life, in 1841, but by 1861, 1862, he's essentially saved Lincoln's presidency by letting him win the war. And it's really a great example of two men who had very different ideological views on a seminal issue, who nevertheless you know, had allowed their friendship to flourish despite it, with really enormous consequences for the country. It, is, it has a profound impact on, on the United States. Yeah, but, and it does. you still think that Madison and Jefferson is the more important one for, the, for US history. Yeah. But I, there is, before we do that, sorry, yeah. I keep interrupting yes. that one. Um, Tim, uh, there's a question at the back there. I can see Tim has got his hand up. 
There's also one there. Oh, sorry. I'm, that's because I can't see you down there. Know, yeah, no, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It has been fascinating to hear your perspective, but my question is, beyond the dynamics and factual aspects of your experiences and insights that you have given, what would you wish your audience to take away from this book? Um, a couple of things. I mean, I think the reason why the book um, has resonated to whatever extent it has is because we all, just to your point, we all appreciate the role that friends play in our own life. And I, I thought in, when I was conceiving of the book that if you then apply it to the most powerful person on the planet, it's got to have some pretty interesting consequences. And I think what I, the kind of overall lesson I learned, and I hopefully I illustrate in my book, is that the presidents who did have first friends we're typically the better for it, and so was our nation. It's not to say that presidents who don't have a best friend are gonna fail, or that presidents who do have a best friend are naturally gonna succeed. I mean, just one quick example of that is George W. Bush had tons of friends, and I was gonna do a chapter on him. He gave me, he wanted to do three different people for his first friend, because he had so many. Um, but his presidency failed because of a recession, a failed war in Iraq. So you can't make that correlation. Um, but I think that, you know, just like in our own lives, I think we all typically feel more nurtured, more, we, we just, we feel better about ourselves, I think, when we're around our, our best friends. And I think people who don't have um, close friendships are generally less happy. And I think st studies have shown that there's a correlation between having good friendships and emotional health. And I think you certainly, uh, see that, I think, in, in the nine examples that I show. And I think, um, and I think hopefully, um, you see the value of friendships in your own life through these nine examples. So something to maybe watch out for when you're electing uh, or voting for. Yeah, yeah it's funny, because we don't ask. I, looked, I went back and looked at all the, the, the 38 presidential debates. You, know, you ask questions, crazy questions in these presidential debates. No one's ever asked, who's your first friend? Do you have a first friend? And how does your first friend relate to you? The, can I just say one real quick story? Mm -hmm. It's in my preface, if you read my book. Um, and I should have mentioned this earlier. I was vetting vice presidents for Bill Clinton in 1992. And I'll make this long story short. I'm going for the final interview of Al Gore. He's one of four finalists. And I'm 29 years old. And the campaign says, you shouldn't be asking Al Gore the hard questions. We need somebody with more stature. So they bring on this. 70-something-year-old Texan who had worked for Lyndon Johnson. And he's going to ask the hard questions while I sit next to him, because I've spent three months researching Al Gore. Can I just tell this real quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So I bring to his, his um, the, in, the interviews in a week, I bring down to his law office like all these notebooks of facts and information about Al Gore from every aspect of his life. And he goes, I don't care about any of that. I got one question. Does Al Gore have a best friend? because it's not clear to me that he does. And I said, well, why do you care about that? And he said, because I worked for Lyndon Johnson for you know, the entirety of his president, presidency, and he didn't have a first friend. And I saw what that meant for him in those dark days when he's you know, trying to figure out what to do in Vietnam. And I think he was an intensely lonely, unhappy man as a result. And if we're gonna interview Al Gore for the vice presidency, and he's gonna be one heartbeat away from the presidency, I don't want to see history repeat itself. So I'm going to ask him that question. And so I said to him, look, at, I, I worked for Al Gore in 1988, so I knew exactly who his friends were. And unlike Clinton, who had a gaggle of friends around the campaign, Al Gore didn't have any friends around on the campaign. He had two really good friends from Congress and his brother-in-law. So I said to Harry, I said, he's going to mention three names. I said, All right, well, let's see. So we go to the interview. He makes chit-chat. He goes, Senator, let me start off by asking, who are your who are your best friends? <laughs> and Gore, like me, is like, what? Why are you asking me that question? And he says, well, you know, who are your friends? He goes, well, Tom Downey, from congressman from New York. He goes, OK, forget it, buddy. Uh, anybody else? Norm Dix from Washington State. Anybody else? My brother-in-law, Frank Hunger. He goes, any friends from Carthage? Any friends from Nashville? Any friends from Harvard? Any friends from the military? He goes, 
Tom Downey, Norm Dix, Frank Unger. So the rest of the interview goes great. No question Al Gore is suited to be vice president. But we get back in the car, go back to Harry's law office, and he goes, you know, if he can't claim one real first friend, how's he going to lead the nation? So he reports back to Warren Christopher at the campaign. He's like, you know, everything checks off, but I'm just worried about this issue of first friend, like a first friend, Warren Christopher. He didn't really get it. He didn't care. Al Gore gets named president, uh, vice president. I asked Clinton later, I said, did it ever bother you that Al Gore didn't have any first friends? Because Gary, I had enough friends for the both of us. I did not <laughs> worry about Al Gore. But that, it's just you know, an example of, of you know, why it may be, you know, at least for Harry McPherson, this is the first time I'd ever even thought of the issue. Maybe it is something that we should be asking candidates for president. I mean, it's Maybe not crazy. Maybe we will now, now that this book is out. <laughs> yeah, I doubt I it. know we're out of time, but Tim, I know you've got one question. Let's take that as the last question, then just, we'll wrap up. Thank you. Just to build an point, who then is Biden's first friend? Yeah. What does that tell us about his presidency? <laughs> um, I can't tell you what it, tells, what it says about his presidency, other than he has a great first friend, somebody I've gotten to know, because I knew this question was going to come up. So I started asking around to Biden loyalists, and everybody to a, to a person said it was Ted Kaufman. Ted Kaufman was his chief of staff for 22 years, but he not only worked with Joe Biden, but he took the train back and forth from Wilmington to Washington because he lived in Wilmington too. And they forged an incredible friendship. And I'll just give you one illustration of it. Um, in 2015, when uh, Joe Biden's son Bo was dying of brain cancer, Joe Biden didn't want to go through it alone. He's the vice president of the United States. So he called up Ted, who was then living in Wilmington. He was an adjunct professor, I think, at Duke at the time. And he said, I need you in Washington. You've got to come down. I'm going to give you a 120 days special governmental exemption, employment exemption, and I need you to just come be here. And Ted Kaufman, without missing a beat, one goes right down to Washington. He takes an office in the executive office building, which is the building right next to the West Wing, and he just sits there and is just there for whenever Joe needs him. So Joe's son dies in May. He's, through, he's his consoler in chief, and then he's just with him throughout that 120-day period as his friend, you know, staying up late at night with him, having early morning walks, whatever it was that gave Joe Biden, that consolation and that, that comfort that he so desperately needed. And it's a really, I mean, I've talked to Ted a lot. It's a beautiful friendship. Um, Ted does not believe in giving advice to Joe Biden. He says to me that these issues are so complex now that unless you're in Washington in the flow of information, he doesn't feel qualified to opine, which I think is an enormous um, show, you know, display of restraint. Because most people would love to opine on these issues, but he's a man of integrity a man of um, just great, great emotional depth. And uh, someday I'd love to write about it, but I, I, not, in, not in any time soon, I don't Maybe think. that's material for your book number two, but what Maybe. are you planning on writing next? Um, I'm, gonna hope, I'm thinking about writing a second book because I had so much fun writing this first one, and I think it's going to be on the presidency again, but a different kind of relationship, which um, hopefully is as much fun for me as this first one was. And do you feel tempted to throw back a question at, at everyone here, of, of friendships of the UK leaders? Uh, in yeah, who's Boris, right who's, who's Boris, Boris, did Boris Johnson have a first friend? <laughs> do we know? <laughs> Anyone know? I never <laughs> looked no at it. Um, Does it matter? Um, is he like, no, he's, no, I shouldn't get into Anyway, politics. but that is, maybe that is uh, something that can be continued after, after we step down. But, um, you're going to sign some books sure. at the back. Sure, happy, yeah, of course. And a huge round of applause. Thank you so much oh, for coming. Thank you. And talking. Thank you for